All right. Good afternoon. For those of you just joining us, I'm going to wait about 30 seconds or so. Uh, we have a very large number of people that have signed up for what I am positive is going to be a fantastic webinar today. I want to give them a chance to jump on here and then we will get started. So hang out for about 30 seconds and we'll get started. All right, those numbers are continuing to grow as I expected they would, uh, but let, I definitely want to give our presenters the maximum amount of time possible. Uh, so let me go ahead and get started, and uh, we'll, we'll turn the floor over to them as quickly as we can. Uh, my name is Kevin Mickey. I am a former ERISA president and the current chair of ERISA's Community Resilience Work Group uh, that is facilitating this and many other exciting and, and uh, interesting webinars on what is becoming a monthly, if not more often, basis. Uh, we'll talk more about that towards the end. Uh, today's title is The Role of GIS in Determining Community Disaster Resilience Zones. Uh, before we get started, I want to point out a couple of very important things. One is at the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A. I very much encourage you to enter questions throughout the webinar that you have in that. Um, we have two presenters today, and I'm sure one of them will constantly be answering those questions. We'll also try to leave a little bit of time at the end uh, if, in case you have questions you want to ask verbally. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, it will be available in the very near future on YouTube. And I encourage you to stick around for a couple of minutes at the end because I want to share some really exciting, I think, announcements. I'm sure you will, too about various upcoming events, some of which have been announced, some of which you're gonna hear for the first time today. So with that, let me introduce our two speakers today. We have with us Casey Zuzak and Patrick Andrews, both from the Federal Emergency Management Agency. I've uh, had an opportunity to work with Casey for, for many years. He's a fantastic presenter. I know, heard the same is true of Patrick, and I know they're gonna have some very important information uh, to share with everyone. So. Uh, gentlemen, I'm going to turn this over to you. There we go. There we go. Did I get all the buttons clicked that I needed to? Are you able to see my screen? Are you able to see me and hear me okay? We certainly can. Thanks, Casey. Awesome. Fantastic. And thanks again for inviting us to talk about how FEMA has used GIS and geospatial technologies to define the community disaster resilient zones. Um, my name is Casey Zuzak, and I'm a senior risk analyst within FEMA's Rapid Directorate, or Risk Analysis Planning and Information Directorate. I'm also the lead for the National Risk Index, as well as the technical lead for defining the community disaster resilient zones. Um, with me, I have Patrick Andrews, who um, also supports, or also is from FEMA and supporting the community disaster resilient zones as the lead for the, our intra-agency component, really understanding within FEMA, what are we able to bring to the table uh, to the community disaster resilient zones that we identified um, in September of last year. So the first thing I wanted to talk through is around the community disaster resilient zone and a little bit about the legislation. Uh, this law or this legislation was passed by Congress on December 20th, 2022, and or in December 2022, was passed by Congress in December 2022 and signed into law by President Biden on December 20th of that year. Um, the law gives us the or requires FEMA to do two things. One is to maintain a natural hazard assessment program, and within that, develop a tool to then the second piece designate community disaster resilient zones at the census tract level across the United States. Also within the legislation, it gives Threema three discretionary authorities. One is to increase the federal cost share uh, to not more than 90% for the brick or building resilient infrastructure and communities program. Second, it enables FEMA to provide financial, technical, and other assistance to communities to carry out preparedness, prepare activities and preparing for resilience or mitigation projects. And the third thing, establish an application process to provide process to provide a FEMA certification for mitigation or resilience projects. 
So what this legislation really does is it helps understand what we can do through data-driven methods to advance resilient actions across the community. It was supported by a number of different organizations across the federal landscape or through our uh, number of organizations. Um, we have a, several that are listed on the side. The Community Disaster Resilience Zone app Act really gives us the goal to build disaster resilience across the country by driving federal investments, private and public sector, nonprofit and philanthropic organizations to really identify and direct resources to the most underserved and most in need communities. Um, we do this through identifying those communities most at risk. Um, using FEMA's National Risk Index, as well as the Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool from the White House's Council on Environmental Quality uh, to define the zones, and then really working with our partners to build out what we can do within these communities. And Patrick's going to talk a lot more about that second part. So the first thing I wanted to talk through was how do we come up with the zones? Uh, we wanted to build out something that is transparent and leverage data and information that we had access to. The law gave us about 180 days to do our first rounds of designation. Uh, we were really close to hitting that deadline. Um, through this, we, in September, on September 6, 2023, uh, FEMA announced our first 483 community disaster resilience zones, focusing on the 50 states in Washington, DC. We leveraged data and information from FEMA's National Risk Index, as well as information from the White House's Council on Environmental Quality's Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool. We also did extensive peer review of our designation methodology with a group of subject matter experts uh, through a data and methodology working group within the Mitigation Framework Leadership Group, or MITFLAG for short. This is a group that brought together experts from a variety of federal agencies and organizations to really understand are we using the best available data and resources um, to define the community disaster resilience zones? I would be remiss if I didn't give some background on the National Risk Index first. So uh, the National Risk Index is a tool that allows for everyone and to understand differences in hazard risk across the country. It measures ha hazard risk through expected annual loss for 18 different natural hazards as well as bringing in components of social vulnerability and community resilience so we can understand how communities may be disproportionately impacted by a hazard. Uh, we measure this at both the county and census tract levels. Uh, census tract is a unit of geography that is sub-county um, that looks at and it has about four to 7,000 people per unit of geography. These are the 18 hazards that we include in the National Risk Index. Anything from avalanche to wildfire, um, extreme heat, winter weather, heat wave, cold wave, drought, uh, earthquake, tsunami, hurricane, landslide. These 18 hazards all have nationally available data that are routinely updated or maintained by either a federal partner or a state organization. Um, and that's really important. We want to make sure we're leveraging the best available data to go into understanding more about the hazard risk. In addition to the hazards, we also include both social vulnerability and community resilience components. This helps us understand how hazards impact communities different. Social vulnerability allows for us to understand which communities are disproportionately impacted by hazards. This includes dispro disproportionate death and injuries and losses uh, from a hazard. For this, the National Risk Index uses the Social Vulnerability Index from the uh, Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, this is also known as SVI. Uh, one thing to note, within the Community Disaster Resilience Zones, uh, we use a modified version of uh, the Social Vulnerability Index to account for three of the four themes um, in defining the zones. The Community Resilience Component um, looks at a different perspective than social vulnerability. It helps us understand which communities are able to take actions to either reduce their impact from hazards or be able to recover more quickly after a disaster or disruption. For this, we use the baseline resilience indicators for communities or BRIC index that's produced by the Hazards Vulnerability and Resilience Institute at the University of South Carolina. Importantly, how do we bring all of this data together? Um, we define risk as a product of the expected annual loss and a function of social vulnerability and community resilience. 
what does that mean? That's a bigger question, right? There's a lot in there. So it's a way for us to take on average, how much loss does a hazard occur or may occur in a given year? We annualize that uh, for each of the 18 hazards, bring the, add that together, and then either increase or decrease that loss uh, based upon the relative impact of social vulnerability and community resilience. Which communities may see increased losses because they're more at risk, more in need? Um, Within the expected annual loss component of the National Risk Index, we include three different factors. Um, that includes an annualized frequency or how often does a hazard occur in a given location, the exposure or what's in the way of a hazard. And we measure three different subtypes for that. Buildings um, and building value, and that is represented as a replacement cost. Not assessed value, not taxable value, not perceived value, not that I think my house is worth way more than it actually is, but what would it cost to actually replace the structure back to where it's at today? Population, and we measure this for fatalities and, and injuries. And then agriculture, uh, which is both crops and livestock. Our historic loss ratio component is the third component of the expected annual loss. This is very similar to a vulnerability function for those familiar in loss modeling. It gives us a way to leverage Historically, what percentage of people buildings, pop, people agriculture buildings were lost from a given event in a given location? We're able to leverage this data and expand it across the country um, to really understand what may losses look like from historic event, similar historic events in a location. So once we put everything into together, um, this is what we come up with. Uh, the top rows are expected annual loss ratings, or what is the annualized losses for a hazard in a given location? On average, each year, what are the impacts? Um, and we measure that in US dollars. Uh, the left-hand column is by county, the, the right is by census tract. Uh, the darker the orange, the higher the expected annual loss. The bottom row is the risk rating, or what happens when we apply the community resilience factors or community risk factors of social vulnerability and community resilience? How does that increase or decrease a community's relative risk to hazards? The darker the red, the higher your relative risk. The darker the blue, the lower. You can see areas in the southern part and the western portions of the country have a higher relative risk to hazards. And in the northeast, um, it's a more resilient part of the country and they have a lower relative risk to hazards. The other tool that we use to define the community res disaster resilience zones is the climate and economic justice screening tool. Uh, this is a product that was developed um, under the Biden administration to really advance the Justice 40 initiatives. Um, it provides us an understanding of which census tracts may be overburdened and underserved. Um, and those are highlighted in the maps on the right hand side. Um, it's really small. I did my best to take some screenshots from the viewer. Uh, but it also looks at eight different themes where they measure the um, how overburdened or underserved one of the communities may be. It's important to note that all federally recognized tribes, as, as well as Alaska Native villages, are identified as disadvantaged communities as well. So as we built out the community disaster resilient zones using these two tools, uh, the first thing we did was identify those census track, or uh, let me take a step back. We wanted to do it as data driven as possible. Uh, we wanted to leverage uh, data to tell us where to go and where to look as much as possible. And one thing that I'm going to show that I have a couple slides on is we, we did a pretty good job at doing that in some areas. Uh, we may not get every census tracked perfect, uh, but we did a really good job of really identifying some of the most at risk to natural hazards and most in need census tracts. Um, and we're really taking in all of the data and information that we received to improve the process moving forward. So the first thing we did in our initial round of designations was identify uh, using the National Risk Index census tracts that ranked in the top 50 nationally or top 1% within each state. This identified just over 800 census tracts across the country. From there, we removed any census tract that was not identified as disadvantaged uh, by the White House's White House Council on Environmental Qualities, um, Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool, or CGIST. Uh, we also used any land area overlap. 
The reason that was important is the National Risk Index uses a census tract vintage from 2020, where CGIS still uses census tracts from the 2010 census. Um, census tracts are dynamic and do change, um, including census numbers. So we couldn't do just a straight join. Um, and that's why we used any land area overlap as recommended by the census using some of their tools that they provide publicly. This identified about 480 census tracts. Uh, it was important for us to have one in every state to maintain some geographic balance. Um, and for those census, those three states, that their highest risk census tract was not identified as disadvantaged uh, by the CGIS tool. Uh, we simply added the highest risk census tract that was identified as disadvantaged by CGIS. Um, and our primary focus in this first round were the, for the 50 states plus Washington, D.C. Um, we also are in the process now of building out designations that are tribally focused, really focusing on tribal nations in our, our next round, as well as territories. Uh, we have not produced designations for the five uh, insular areas, and we're working on building those out um, now. We don't have the same data available, which is unfortunate that we don't have community resilience data to support um, in the, the territories. And without that, um, we we're taking a little bit of a different approach for those communities. Since we're all ge geographers, or most of us are geographers or GIS people, um, I thought it would be great to put a map in here. Um, census tracts, they come in all different shapes and sizes. Um, because it's a population-based unit of geography, uh, some are hundreds of miles across. Others may be a city block, like, a, like we see along the East Coast and some of the more populated areas. Um, this displays the census tracts across the country. Um, some are easy to see and some are just gray specks on the map. Um, and that's just how census tracts are defined. And breaking it down by state. Um, again, these are census tracts, so they're not counties, they're not jurisdictions, they're not other units of geography. We really focused on census tracts because that's what the law tells us to do. Um, so a couple of things that really get to understanding more about these census tracts. Um, 76% of the community disaster resilience zones that are identified um, face at least three or more hazards rated as very high or relatively high by the National Risk Index. So these are some of the most at-risk census tracts across the country. 84% have a high social vulnerability rating. These are some of the most in need. So it really gives us a that really gave us a lot of encouragement that we may have really identified some of the most at risk, most in need. Also on the geographic balance side, 36% um, are in large metro areas and 37% of this community disaster resilience zones that were designated are in rural parts of the country. Uh, these do make up about six tenths of a percent of the population. Um, so we are continuing to build out and roll out additional um, zones. Like I said, we have the tribal nations and uh, territory designations that will be coming out later this year. And we're working on taking in data and information to build out future zone designations. And this is the last thing I wanted to touch on. Um, and it's, I think, really a, a great perspective to, to look at some of the data behind the zone designations. Um, the x-axis is the mean household income. Um, this is how much the median income is. Um, and the vertical axis is axis is the expected annual loss or how much a community sees in annualized losses a year. Our goal is should be really that top my top left quadrant um, where all the colored dots are. That's my that was my goal. And we did a really good job of really identifying some of those household or those communities that have a lower median income, which can be one of the which is a driving factor that we know in social vulnerability and resilience. Um, and those communities that have high losses. Um, and we there are a few that fall outside of there for whatever reason. Um, some of it is Alameda County, uh, California. It's a, it's may have not be the same value as other parts of the country from an income perspective, but it has high losses, um, as well as some of those communities that have really high impact. So um, overall, um, falling in that the upper left-hand quadrant is is where we I really identified and mostly where we landed. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Patrick to talk about the benefits of a community disaster resilient zone 
uh, before opening it up to questions. And Patrick, if it works for you, uh, just tell me next slide and I can just go ahead and click through. Oh, sure thing, thanks. All right, what are the benefits of uh, CEDARS designations? And I, before we get into this and you can start to read some of these benefits, I wanna very much stress that this is a ongoing effort. In other words, these are not cast in stone as Casey, will, I'm sure will comment about um, upgrading you know, future designations and getting more and more refined with the data and you know, some of the gaps in the data. Uh, how we implement this is, is very much an ongoing uh, enterprise that we are looking for ideas, that we are examining each programs, we're, we're doing outreach coordination with other federal programs and private nonprofits to see how we can apply this risk-based uh, assessment in prioritizing resources, whether they're nonprofit resources, private resources, federal resources, or state resources. So uh, right now, if you look in the uh, NOFL, Notice of uh, uh, Federal um, uh, offering the increased cost share up to 90% is evident in the BRIC and the FMA uh, NOFOs for this year, for 2023. There, uh, the BRIC program also has direct technical assistance uh, available on a contractor basis and they have regional representatives and they do, they do outreach to regions um, and work with uh, communities that need that basic resource help on hazard mitigation plans, uh, scoping of, of, of projects, um, assisting in framing technical work that may have to be done like H and H studies, structural studies, soil state, soil uh, analysis, th those kinds of things. And the BRIC and FMA NOFOs also, also align um, additional application points for being a CEDARS designated community, as well as uh, uh, assistance is provided for the benefit cost um, uh, analysis, which is a prerequisite for um, most FEMA or especially uh, HMA and uh, uh, program um, uh, project applications. So in other words, you have to prove cost effectiveness and that benefit cost analysis can get quite involved from the perspective of local communities. So there's assistance to do that if you are a CEDARS designated community. Um, the, I mentioned on the right, there is definitely, um, this is meant to go on beyond just federal and FEMA uh, programs. We're, we're hoping to spur nonprofit investment and involvement in these areas. Uh, increased awareness and, and increased access to, to resources from a wide variety of partners uh, and also private sector partners to be able to invest in these areas um, as the model is more or less like an opportunity zone. There may be in the future tax breaks, there may be uh, in the future other incentives to, to guide prioritization of resources towards these areas. So go ahead, Casey, give me the next slide. And uh, like uh, Case and I have mentioned, there are many federal partners involved in, in, in this effort. And you can go down the list and just see some of these, some of the agencies involved in this. So the, again, the idea is to be able to prioritize resources to communities most in need, most vulnerable to disaster impacts. Um, and uh, that vulnerability, as Case and Casey has mentioned, includes social vulnerability, it includes resilience, it includes vulnerability to future uh, climate change impacts. So we have been reaching out, and again, this is this is very much in the incipient stages of seeing how we can multiply these designations or leverage these designations among other federal among other federal agencies. So there's obviously a number of federal agencies involved in disaster response and recovery. And we are we are working very closely with these federal partners to try to see how we can leverage these designations again to try to prioritize resources towards these towards these areas of uh, high risk. All right, Casey, go ahead. 
And much of this is, uh, again, just a, a summarization of what we've already talked about. Um, nonprofit and philanthropic organizations are very important as part of this effort. Uh, private nonprofits or, or data um, associations that, that can drive awareness of patterns of vulnerability, patterns of high risk, particular needs will be very important. Um, and Casey, one thing would be really beneficial to talk about, we've had a few questions, uh, is how are you, how might you incorporate local data sets, state data sets, um, uh, other, other data that points to, uh, that reveals more accurately local conditions and drivers of vulnerability, drivers of resilience. Uh, how, what are your plans to be able, just in general, a framework to incorporate those kinds of things in future designations? But this is the point of the slide is it's, it's very much an effort beyond just what FEMA programs or mitigation programs can do. We are, we are looking to leverage private capital, leverage PNP partnerships and, um, definitely as a widespread um, coordination endeavor to try to get resources to the communities most in need is the bottom line. So go ahead, Casey, take it away. Okay. And this is the portion where I'm going to pause and see if there's any questions before I jump in and do a live demo. I figured, um, it's a group of GIS professionals and GIS in geography interested people. Um, it'd be great to do a demonstration of some of the platforms that we have developed uh, under the Community Disaster Resilience Zone Initiative. Yep, we've got no questions, just with the exception of you know the, a person from the New York City area saying, yeah, they've got a lot of local data that they can possibly leverage or inform some of the gaps that we have in our national data sets right now. So that's about the only question. How are And how are we planning to incorporate important data like tsunamis, volcanic areas, some of the some of the tribal gaps, some of the territorial gaps in our in our future designations. All right. Yeah, and I am more than happy to talk through that. And I think a lot of it is, you know, we're within the first round of designations, we we were given 180 days to come up with the designations and we leverage data and information that existed. We're continuing working with our partners at the new tsunami, National Tsunami Hazard Mitigation Program and the USGS and NOAA to build out additional data for the tsunami hazard. Um, there's not a national tsunami hazard layer available. Um, there's different data available for different states, uh, different frequencies, different return periods. Some are expressed in timeframes that are based upon geologic buildup for stress versus some are probabilistic data. Um, so they really just don't match and it's really difficult for national a level, national comparisons of data. So one thing working through NTHMP or the National Tsunami Hazard Mitigation Program is building these relationships within um, our federal partners and state counterparts to be able to understand what data exists so that we can build a national tsunami hazard data layer with USGS working with um uh, our partners at the USGS to understand more about evacuation modeling so that we can incorporate those data into the NRI. Um, a lot of it just that it didn't exist at the time and we're having to go through and build data. It's a long process. Um, you know, we've, we've only been at it. We've been at it for a while, focused on it um, just over a year now of building out these additional data sets and continue to build out things into the future. And then I see a, a question in the chat from Alice or in the Q&A from Alice. It says, um, I'm assuming similar to local data, we have a NCGICC that coordinates GIS data statewide. Are you working with such agencies? Um, that's a great question. So we've been primarily focused working with our resilience partners. Um, that includes usually a lot of state emergency managers um, as we build out the National Risk Index, um, as well as some state geologists and a lot of our federal partners. Um, but I do think on the GIS side, a lot of the data are available. Um, but if there are specific groups, uh, we do usually do look at our partners to help drive and uh, direct that conversation. But if, there's any, if there is anyone that we should talk with, please let us know. Um, I'm 
we're more than happy to have those conversations. Um, all right, so jumping in on, on the community disaster resilience zones, uh, the website is pretty easy to find if you go to fema.gov slash CDRZ. Um, that is a way to quickly get to the community disaster resilience zones page that you see that I'm at right now. Um, this gives us a couple different options. It has a ton of information about what the zones are, the ethos of the program or the initiative, and what went into describing these, these zones and initiatives. Um, to get to the platform I'm going to demonstrate, there's two different options. One, there's an anchor link at the top that I'm going to click. It takes you down to accessing the platform in this blue box, or you can simply scroll to it as well. Um, I did preload some pages uh, because live demos do terrify me, um, but I did want to make sure the, to walk through all the process. So I made, hopefully I don't have to jump around, but if I do, I apologize in advance. Um, this is just a notification that you are leaving the FEMA.gov space and going to a platform that's hosted on the Esri, an Esri experience. Um, here it gives users the ability to understand more about what went into the zone designations. Um, a little bit about the zones, uh, linked to the FEMA National Risk Index. Um, at first, you do see a picture up here on the top right. Uh, this is a link to the, the viewer, but I'll get to that in a second. I do want to demonstrate um, another portion first. Um, also on our top navigation bar, you do have the ability to see our designation methodology, as well as downloading all of the data and information in GIS and geospatial formats, um, access to GIS services, or CSVs. I, it's usually the lowest common denominator is a Excel file, and we have that available as well. Um, so the first thing is we are kind of given the idea of we need to talk about zones. People need to know where their zones are. I know about as much of my local geography as anyone around me. I, I'm a geographer by training and it's what I do. Um, I cannot tell you my census tract ID. Um, I should know that by now, but I may know my county FIPS code, but a lot of people don't know their tract. It also inter intersects multiple jurisdictions, multiple different communities, and census tracts are very hard to grasp. So the first challenge we had was how can we communicate a census tract uh, to a different group? Um, and the way to do that we came up with was using an Esri experience uh, where it was simply just querying. Um, most people know what their state is. Um, in this case, I will do Colorado. Um, and from there, it zooms into the state of Colorado and then gives the users the ability to identify any of the counties that have a community disaster resilient zone. In this case, I'm going to choose Larimer County. Um, and it highlights the zones uh, within Larimer County, Colorado. There are three zones. Um, just north of Fort Collins. Uh, to reset any of the selections, all you simply do is reset under county and then reset again under state and you see all the zones uh, then appear on the product. Additionally, at the bottom of the page, we do have access to other tools uh, and resources to help build community res resilience that FEMA provides. I'm not, I'll, I'll I'm going to click on the methodology because it's here and I want people to see that it is publicly available um, and provides the data and information of how we came to um, the zone designations, as well as um, our contact information at the bottom for questions. Also download this document as a PDF. So the next thing I'm going to go to is the view zones. Uh, this is that box in the upper right hand corner that I described earlier right here. If you click on view zones, um, it will take you to an ArcGIS online platform. Here users have the ability to understand more about their risk, what's driving the risk in those zones, what data and infrastructure may be at risk in those, pro in those areas um, to get a general understanding. Um, there are several splash screens to help walk users through the experience, um, how to add data, and where to look for those communities that may need, or individuals that may not be familiar with Esri's products. Mm -hmm. uh, users also have the ability to go to the homepage or download button. Um, the map does have, the, the platform does have most or all of the G basic GIS functions. So you can search by location, address, uh, you can add data or zoom in, zoom out, pan, um, go to the home zoom extent, as well as changing the base maps. Um, which can which is very useful. Uh, users have the ability to turn on and off different layers. 
as well as increase or decrease the transparency of those layers as well. Um, and as you can see, as layers do are enabled, uh, they do appear in the legend in the bottom right. The last thing I wanted to demonstrate is that users have the ability to um, add any data layers. So let's just say I wanted to search Esri's Living Atlas and add um, storm reports of recent um, severe weather events. You just simply can click on it. You can click on the information with tab, which will go to um, provide more information about it. Let's see. This is the this is the the terrifying thing with live demos. I'm, re I'm relying on technology. All right, we selected it. Selected one layer. Two layers, and I'm going to hit done with the selection. And then there is one other step you have to hit add data. You do have to add that layer. So if you click on the four button, you can click add to map. Square circles. And that adds it to the map and you can zoom in, zoom out, pan. Um, there were some recent tornadoes in Miami a couple of days ago. As data continually adds, you can see this demonstrates how those data become available. Um, is there a way to collapse the layer box? Unfortunately, there's not. Um, the way that Esri develops this um, is you have a couple of different options. And one is you either make a layer icon. Um, a lot of the collapsible boxes, like what we have in the National Risk Index, um, are custom coding. So unfortunately, um, it's it's not as, as uh, straightforward. Um, can you apply or can you filter the community disaster resilient zones um, by hazard? Or could they be impacted by any of the 18 hazards. And Patrick's typing the answer in the chat. Um, but while he does that, I think the highlight is for our first round of designations, we looked at the composite risk score. So we summed all 18 hazards together instead of looking at the individual hazards. Um, within the National Risk Index you, application, you do have the ability um, to do that. You can look at each of the individual hazards. Um, the other thing I wanted to demonstrate, um, and this is a great point, um, so I don't forget, is within the application that I'm demonstrating now, we do have a link to the National Risk Index Census Tract reports. Uh, you can simply just click on any census tract. It could be a cedar zone or not. Uh, you can click view, and that will take you directly to a National Risk Index report highlighting the hazard risk for that census tract. Um, that can either be downloaded or then the report can be printed off as well. So this can help you understand more about the hazard risk profile for that census tract. So I think that wraps up the demonstration portion that I, I had planned. Um, and it was pretty, it, the application, it, you know, it does leverage ArcGIS Online, which is a, a great platform uh, to communicate information. Um, you can enable different layers. You can zoom in, zoom out. You can understand more about what are driving some of the um, zone designations. Um, we have all of the zones published through Esri's Living Atlas as well, um, which is a great resource for, for uh, communities and to access data and information. So with that, I am more than happy to answer any questions and then um, you know, turn it over back over to Patrick and see if he has any closing comments. And if not, um, turn it back to Kevin. I do, let me see. I do not have many closing comments, but I, um... I encourage you to give us your feedback because like I emphasized in the beginning, um, how we implement this is obviously is in the beginning stages and how Casey and his team uh, refines the data. It interacts with state 
agencies and, and regional FEMA partners and local partners and other organizations such as yourself is obviously very important. So uh, we are not saying that insincerely. Uh, please reach out and let's figure out a way where we can where we can coordinate that exchange of information and those ideas because um, because like I said, we are in the very beginning stages of this and this is a this is a big big effort. You can you can understand when you just say a concept like communities most in need. Well, what does that mean? That's that's an enormous question. So uh, we appreciate your help on and trying to answer that and improve the program or the initiative moving forward. So thank you. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I was going to say a couple of things to add on my end. Um, there's QR codes. Um, or or the link if you're old school like me. Uh, you can click the link or just navigate there directly, or you can scan it with your phone. Um, I have my my name and email, um, and any questions you guys have, we can get those over to the Community Disaster Resilience Zones team as well. Um, I did not update that on the last slide before I put this together, so apologies for that. Um, I, I think the big thing, too, is what's next? Um, as we continue to understand more about hazard risk, uh, we're continuing to update and modify the National Risk Index to include the best available data tools and information. Um, big updates in our next round are really going to focus on two different hazards. Um, the tsunami hazard um, and working through NTHMP and building out better data and information um, that reflects both nearshore and distant tsunamis, the ability of a community to evacuate or not evacuate uh, fully for a, a nearshore tsunami. And we don't have any we have a lot of data and more data are becoming available through our partnership with NTHMP um, that we're, we're excited for building that out. Um, and then the other hazard is riverine hazard. Again, in the absence of uh, multiple return hazard, multiple return period hazard data across the entire country, it's really difficult to estimate annualized losses. So we're working with a lot of our partners within FEMA and our, our across the organization to understand what data can be used so that we can improve the, the flood hazard risk component within the NRI um, beyond what we're using now. So super excited for those two changes or updates. In case you oh, Go ahead, Patrick. No, I say partners usually don't put other people on the spot like this, but I, I, I know you're really bright and you think about these things all the time. So, the climate change, uh, accounting for climate change often involves probabilistic models, you know, future facing models um, that to me, you know, standing on the outside, looking into what what the uh, data people and the GIS people have to accomplish is um, that's a big task. How how do you integrate probabilistic models with historic models and how do you sort all that out? I mean, that would be a really interesting question to hear from the group about, but do you have any thoughts on that? And I, I again, I apologize. You can shoot me later, but I don't mean putting you on the spot. <laughs> uh, it's good because it's where I was going, right? My next statement was really around. We're also in the process of working with our partners at NOAA and NASA on building out a climate informed risk index. So what does that mean? It's being able to leverage climate data that are available, uh, focusing preliminarily on five hazards, um, wildfire, extreme heat, hurricane wind, drought, yeah. and coastal flooding. I hope I got all five of those. I think I, sea, le sea level rise, that's in the uh, coastal Yeah, flooding coastal flooding, which is focused primarily yeah. on sea level yeah. rise. And being able to bring that data into the same framework. Um, modeling data and information into the future is always challenging. There's a lot of beginning to be a lot more downscaled information that we can use to make data-driven decisions. So for those five hazards initially, uh, we're working on building out a climate-informed factor, which is a factor that we can apply to the expected annual loss, uh, which is what science and research shows is a, a great way for us to start thinking about how hazard risk is changing into the future. And so by leveraging that climate risk factor, we're able to put together at least a climate-informed product so we can say, hey, this is the National Risk Index. This is what it may look like in, in the future and where we may see impacts based upon what we have built today. 
We know people are building differently into the future. We know we're building with better and stronger and more resistant buildings. We're incorporating hazard resilient building codes. Uh, people aren't living in the same places and people are not going to live in the same places moving forward. Um, there's a lot of great data out there, um, but we still need to also identify what data is available. What data do we need? What are the determinants of risk into the future? Um, and we know bringing in the climate informed piece now gives us a great starting point for that. Um, we need to be able to walk before we run. So um, it's a prototype that we're working on building out with our partners um, and hope to release it later this year. Um, and, but it's still, you know, something that's in progress. Yeah, definitely. And and then a huge question to throw out to the group again is how do you, if you are prioritizing resources, how do you model program effectiveness or how do you model uh, increases in a concept like resilience? How do you operationalize resilience? How do you measure resilience is also a very important question because how do you know what you're doing is working? You know, and that is uh, that is a very complicated question. We're engaging with uh, um, USACE and um, the American Society of Civil Engineers on some of those questions. But again, that is a, that is an enormous uh, issue or opportunity for coordination and feedback. Uh, so, because obviously, how you define your program objectives are going to, uh, uh, and how you define those concepts of risk resilience is obviously gonna drive how you're gonna measure program effectiveness. So we would definitely appreciate coordination on those kinds of issues. How do you do it at the state level? How do you do it at the local level if any local communities are actually doing that at this point? All right, and with that, I'll turn it back to you, Kevin, and more than happy to answer any additional questions that come up. Um, you know, you guys have our email. Kevin, you know where to get me. Um, oh, yeah. I'm not going to be on the March March meeting. I'm not on the agenda for March, am I? I did I miss that? <laughs> did you say yeah? <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I want to not a question, but a comment. Um, a few of us on this call, I suspect, like myself, have been in this profession um, in resilience mitigation. You know, it's been called a lot of things over the years, and resilience is the word that we're using most commonly today, but there's something that I want to applaud you and your colleagues for doing. Uh, those of us from the early times remember when all these types of efforts happened in isolation from one another. And it's no accident that over the last few months, we've invited representatives from FEMA and different agencies to come and talk about what they're working on. What I think is wonderful is these things are not happening in isolation from one another. The fact that you and Patrick are here today is a great example of this. Um, and that's not the only thing. Uh, Patrick, you highlighted the importance of working with different federal agencies. That was not always how federal agencies work together, but it's become over the last few years a really tight focus and it's extraordinarily important that that does happen. You also highlighted the importance of wanting community engagement, which is fantastic. You know, this is something that's not always been as common as it is today. So we're headed in a good direction. You know, this is my personal opinion, but I do applaud your efforts and, you know, those of your colleagues and FEMA and elsewhere. Um, if you don't mind uh, sharing or cutting off your screen share, I want to just talk briefly about a couple of things. Uh, everyone, you do have 10 more, more minutes or whenever we finish to drop more questions in the chat. Uh, take these guys seriously. They want your input. <laughs> so don't keep it to yourself. Uh, let me go ahead and briefly share my screen. We'll wrap up here. Too many windows open. Can you see my screen now? Anybody want to let me know? Hopefully you're looking yes. at a screen that says your wrist up. Perfect, I can, thanks. I can see your screen, I can hear you, and I can see you, so you got All to right, all right, well, let's let's uh, bring it home then. So if uh, if this is your first exposure to your RISA, um, I would like to tell you that if you're looking for a professional community that does things like this, engages in these sorts of topics and many others, you found a home. Um, I joined ERISA a number of years ago. It was the best professional decision I've ever made, and I mean that sincerely. Um, we do have a very dynamic, exciting, and constantly growing 
webinar series as part of our climate and community resilience efforts. Uh, this is one of, I think we've done half a dozen just in the last three or four months. Uh, webinars, we have many more to come. The next one up on Tibet is on April 2nd, uh, where representatives from the Association of State Floodplain Managers will be joining us to talk about where GIS fits in flood hazard identification and analysis and solutions. And they'll be talking about the types of products that um, FEMA and other organizations use and how those can be applied and are applied at a local level. So all these pieces and parts can and should fit together. This is not the only thing ERISA does. It happens to be one of the ones I love, certainly, but it's not the only thing ERISA is about. Uh, we have a very long, in fact, we just celebrated our 60th anniversary, uh, believe it or not, a very long history of recognizing excellence in our state and local communities. One of the ways we do threat that is through um, an, a series of awards rep recognizing distinguished systems, um, tools and so forth that are put in place to make communities uh, safer, more resilient, more successful, you know, all the things that we do as professionals. Um, these are some examples. We do invite winners of these awards to present. I encourage you to take advantage of those opportunities. You see this first one coming up from the Miami Valley Regional Commission, and it just happens to be on something related to disasters. And they did some great work there. Uh, and there's a number of other ones coming up here as well. We have um, an incredibly popular, this is going to uh, fill, I'm very sure of that, it's darn close now, uh, session coming up on March 13th on best practices when you're thinking about uh, the geo, you know, in geospatial data governments. Um, this is going to be a panel of experts that have lots of different perspectives uh, that I think you will find extremely rewarding to take the opportunity to uh, be part of that and engage in that conversation. We do not just do webinars in education. We have a lot of training that is offered as well. Um, easily one of the most successful initiatives that ERISA has had in its portfolio over the many years it's existed is the GIS Leadership Academy. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing to know how to run the software. It's a whole different thing to understand how to be a leader in the profession. The Leadership Academy provides those skill sets. We've offered many of these around the country and beyond, and we'll continue to do so. As you see, we have three scheduled around this around the U.S. this year. Uh, if you have never attended, or even if you have, uh, the ERISA's annual GIS Pro Conference, you have missed the best conference of the year. Yes, I am selfish saying that, very uh, motivated, but I got to tell you, it's true. Um, this is an amazing place to come together and network with people that you have common interest with. You will, you cannot help but learn uh, something new there and make new connections. Don't miss that. This one's going to be in Portland, Maine, which is just beautiful in October. Um, I've been told it's going to be perfect. <laughs> uh, and then we do have a virtual conference. This one on location enterprise addressing and public safety that's coming up um, actually very quickly, uh, February 27th to 29th. Um, one of our regional partners, CalGIS, uh, is having a, a conference just next month. In April, we also have our GIS and Valuations Technology Conference from April 8 to 11. Uh, if you're part of the ERISA family, and we hope you become if you're not already, uh, we're all about sharing, we're about learning, but we're also about connecting. Uh, we have a platform where you can stay in touch with one another on an ongoing basis. Pose a question, you'll get an answer, you'll learn something new, you'll expand your horizons um, and, and become empowered to serve the people that you work for and with um, even better than you already do. So in closing, uh, let me thank our presenters one final time. Uh, you are very much appreciated for the work that you do and the time that you took today to share the information that you did. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, it makes a difference. We're part, we were happy to have the services and the products that you create. Uh, we're equally as pleased to be able to contribute to making them even better. And as the geospatial community, and we really appreciate you emphasizing the importance of the work that we do, um, we're glad to have that opportunity to be part of your success. So with that, um, I will close this and uh, Wish you a very good day, and we'll see you at the next webinar. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you, Kevin. See you all later. You bet.